Now, this goes through the 19th century in two tracks. On the left, we have David Ricardo. My favourite little Ricardo quote I dug up on this one is the following. The condition of the labourers is most wretched, yet government should not compensate their lot. Rather, attempts to amend the condition of the poor instead of making the poor rich make the rich poor. So the proper role of the government is to teach the poor the value of independence rather than to alter the distributions of the markets. Mitt Romney, anyone? I mean, I'm just saying, right? So anyway, there's basically they can't live with it and don't want to pay for it problem. So, you know, they'll be miserable and awful, but pff, what can you do? You can't change anything. That's just lazy fair. On the other hand, you have this guy. Any points for who this is? Handsome chap, isn't he? That's John Stuart Mill, right? And John Stuart Mill, is, as well as having on liberty and wondering about this whole thing called democracy that's coming down the turnpike like a giant Sisyphean rock, is also writing the treatise on political economy. And in the treatise on political economy, his comments on debt are basically, look, it may lead to crowding out, and that's a bit of a problem, but you have to pay for stuff, because if you don't, they're going to get the vote, and they're going to take everything, and that's going to be much, much worse. So the tension in liberalism becomes these two strands, the Ricardian side, which is no, just no, I'm not dealing with this, versus the, look, there's a thing called the state, and you're going to have to learn to love it. So that's where the 19th century begins to move. This ends up with two movements, coming out of Bombarwick, the, the Methoden strike with the German historical school versus the so-called Austrian school. You end up with Mises and the Austrian school, we'll go back to that in a moment. The other side of this is the new liberalism. The new liberalism, of course, comes from Hobhouse and then goes through Tawney, ends up with Keynes and Marshall and so on and so forth. And they really are just instantiations of the, I refuse to countenance that the state even has a part to play. Therefore, debt is by definition bad. Versus, okay, it may not be the best thing, maybe a second best solution globally, but we need to have the state, otherwise the whole thing becomes so unstable that it's never going to work. And that reaches its zenith of the whole Keynesian moment. Now, when the crisis of the 1920s hits, this guy's very important. Anyone knows who this is? That's Joseph Schumpeter, and he really looks like that. It's totally <laughs> freaky, but he really does. Um, when you get to the United States in the 1920s, it's got a very strong Austrian inflection. Uh, not really because of intellectual contacts. Strangely, they seem to, uh, apart from Schumpeter himself, who's Austrian finance minister and a professor, and he ends up over here at Harvard in the 1920s. But you end up with um, both schools touting what they both call in various uh, ways business cycle theory. In the United States, it's called modern business cycle theory. And it's a classic sort of Austrian idea that the economy itself is what they call a long-run capital structure. So you build some stuff and then that leads to other stuff and that leads to other stuff and you end up kind of over here as an evolutionary story. And this is this long-run evolutionary thing. And of course it has cyclical ups and downs, particularly when you have banks giving you too easy credit. So if you try and compensate for the downs, what you do is pervert the capital stock and the capital structure even further and you end up even further off what you call the equilibrium path. So the worst thing you can actually do is not allow austerity to happen because that's the purge, right? This is the hangover after the party. Whenever you have a bad period, it's because of malinvestment. That malinvestment, by the way, is usually because the state is issuing too much debt or they're encouraging the banking system to do the same by having these idiotic things such as central banks because after all, you really should just have free money so that the risk is borne on the issue, right? So this is the way this works out in the years, very similar to the Austrian school. So the basic story is it's a moral misallocation of capital and what you need to do is when you have the boom, you have the bust, you go through the bust as quickly as possible and then you basically exit and everything goes back to normal. The Brits, of course, have a more refined version of this one and that's the Treasury view. This is Winston Churchill, actually, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. For those of you who are interested in British political trivia, that box is the same box that the Chancellor uses every day on budget speak. And that box has been around since about 1794, which tells me that really Britain is totally bankrupt. I mean, if they just can't actually get a new box for the guy, you know, that's pretty bad. Anyway, what happens here is you have a more refined version of this. And the doctrine of laissez-faire, basically the Ricardian story, is very much the dominant school of economics. But the practicalities of liberalism from the turn of the century, the extension of uh, the invention of unemployment benefits, the growth and extension of, private pe of public pensions, the role of the state in the economy is becoming bigger over time, particularly after World War I. So Britain goes back on the gold, Britain basically has a choice. It can go back on the gold standard or not, and it tries to go back on the gold standard. It takes us several years to do so. The reason being, Churchill himself is like, this is going to be a nightmare. It's going to generate a huge amount of unemployment. The reason you want to go back on the gold standard is because you have this thing called the City of London. Huge financial entrepot. This basically takes capital generated within Britain or from the empire that's recycled and then sends it out. It's a classic sort of global hegemonic role. 
This means there are lots and lots of people who hold sterling denominated assets. So if you have a free flow after World War I, when you've basically spanked 80% of the national treasury, your exchange rate's going to go down. It's going to be great for exports, but all the holders of those sterling assets are going to freak out. They're going to dump them. You're going to have the mother of all runs on the pound. So they were between a rock and a hard place, either suffer domestic unemployment or have a collapse in the exchange rate, which when you still think you're running the world is something you want to, you want to avoid. So you have high unemployment through the 1920s. There's a pamphlet comes out written by Lloyd George, a liberal leader, and Keynes writes a response called Can Lord George Do It? when he basically anumbrates the basic idea of the multiplier, the need for public works, etc., etc. And this leads to the Treasury Review. And the Treasury Review is the memoranda on certain proposals on unemployment. And this is when they do their, no, we're not going to do this. It's all about austerity moment. And they're all about austerity moment invokes a very modern but very old idea called Ricardian equivalence. And this is the heart of the austerity claim. It's the notion that basically government policy will have an impact, a shock, on expectations. Expectations are forward-looking, if not rational. So basically, if the government says, I'm going to spend some money, you go, OK, what's it for? And you go, that's a waste of time. What you'll do is you'll look at your lifetime expected income adjust for the tax increase, possibly save to offset it, or at least, try and expect, uh, at least try and protect yourself. So the policy becomes self-defeating at best, or you'll end up with a perverse outcome at worst because of the negative expectation shock. So the notion of recording, recording equivalence. This is the heart of the memoranda. As well as having a classical crowding out view, if the government takes money, then there'll be no money left for private sector investment. Ricardian equivalence is tied to the notion of investment. It says if we do this, then investors will get freaked out and they will invest even less. And more to the point, and this is very apropos of the Obama stimulus, there just aren't enough, they didn't use this word, they talked about suitability, there aren't enough shovel-ready projects if you want to do the public work. So basically the same old arguments are actually there. Um, let me give you Winston Churchill's budget speech on this. Um, when the government borrows in the money market, it becomes a competitor with industry and engrosses itself to re on resources which would otherwise have been employed by private enterprise and in the process raises the rent of money to all who have need for it. So there you have exactly the same types of arguments that were before but also you will see are present as we move forward as well. Now all of this lasts based... Go ahead. Uh, what year was that proposal? 1927. I want to say 26, but it might be 29. Well, 29, yeah. Well, 26 was the year of the general strike. Right. Okay. So it's either it's 26. I'm pretty sure. I'll need to check. Uh, it's in the book. You know, just finish it. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, 